And they do it in the movie theaters, but it's amazing. Cool. And then everyone just, you and Karen, geriatrics. And she's currently the field leader for the Masters of Clinical Science in Wound Healing at Western and Wound Care Project Manager at Aging Rehabilitation and Geriatric Research Center of Lawson Healthcare Research Institute. Karen has played a key role in the development or the revision of all four of our guidelines on wound healing. And she has published several articles and book chapters on wound healing and been a very active presenter and uh, at our events and at many wound care conferences. And she's here with Gary Sibold, her co-lead on the panel for the Guideline Assessment and Management of Pressure Injuries for the Interprofessional Team. And Gary, no stranger to the whole area of wound healing, is a dermatologist and internist with a special interest in wound care and education. He's a professor of medicine and public health at the University of Toronto. And Professor Sibold is the co-founder, this was in 1999, and course director of the International Interprofessional Wound Care Course, and it's known as IIWCC. And this course is offered at U of T, Stellenbosch University, New York University, and West Asia. He's also a director of the Masters of Science in Community Health for Prevention and Wound Care at the Della Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. So we're very fortunate today to have these very knowledgeable and engaged presenters who are so passionate about wound care. Now today's agenda, we're going to start with an overview of the RNAO Best Practice Guideline Program to make sure this is in context. And then we will move into talking more specifically about the guideline. And there we will cover purpose and scope. What are the specific changes to the new edition with this best practice guideline release? And we'll talk about the guideline development process and then provide a summary of the recommendations. And as you know, if you know about the RNAO guidelines, these recommendations always focus on practice, education, system, organization, and policy. And then we will have a question and answer period. Now before I go into talking about RNAO, I did want to make sure that you were all aware that we have thousands of attendees at this webinar. We know we have about uh, four to 500 sites engaged and that there are many at each site. We also know that we have um, uh, uh, participants from Ontario, from across Canada and internationally. So welcome to you all. The RNAO, which um, hosts the Best Practice Guideline Program, is the professional association of registered nurses, nurse practitioners, and nursing students in the province of Ontario. And RNAO is seen and has uh, earned the reputation of being a strong, credible voice leading the nursing profession to influence and promote both healthy public policy through our very robust policy department and clinical excellence through our signature program, the International Affairs and Best Practice Guidelines Program. Now just so you know uh, about the program, this next slide does focus on the three large pillars of our program and the uh, pillar to the right, which is the purpose of all of our work. And I'll start with that. The impact of the International Affairs and Best Practice Guidelines Program, it's always intended to be uh, patient, client, resident outcomes, provider outcomes, organization outcomes, and indeed overall system outcomes. So if we're not making a difference in those areas, we need to ask why and go back to the drawing board. So the entire BPG program consists of first a very robust guideline development process. It's a seven step process that starts with topic identification, involves um, the best research through systematic reviews, engages 
experts as well as numerous users through a very comprehensive guideline or comprehensive um, stakeholder assessment. And then, of course, publication and dissemination. The second big pillar is dissemination and, of course, support for implementation. Our guidelines are only as good as the impact they have in clinical settings, and they will not have impact unless they're used. So we have numerous strategies, not the least of which is our best practice spotlight organization designation, the so welcome to any BPSOs who are on the line. Our last pillar is evaluation and monitoring. And again, we want to know the impact of the guidelines on client outcomes, provider outcomes, and organizations. The nursing quality indicators for reporting and evaluation, uh, indicator data system, is a key aspect of our evaluation pillar. And through that, we identify the impact of our guidelines. So that really is the um, overview of our uh, entire BPG program, and it's through that then that we come to uh, be here with you explaining and expanding on the newest edition of the Pressure Injury Guideline. I want to turn things over now to Grace Suva, who will begin by talking about the purpose and scope of this guideline. Thank you, Irma Jean. So the purpose of the assessment and management of pressure injuries for the interprofessional team is in fact very similar to this 2007 edition of the guideline, obviously with um, updated evidence. Uh, the similarities include a continued focus on the assessment and management of pressure injuries in adults, which we define as greater than 18 years of age. And although principles may overlap, there is a separate RNAO guideline for the focus on risk assessment and prevention of pressure injuries. The main differences with the purpose and scope of this edition is that there is more of an emphasis on the interprofessional team with regard to wound care assessment and management. And obviously, as you see in the title, um, the term pressure alters has been changed to pressure injuries. So, what is a pressure injury? Let me just go back to the slide here. So the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel states that a pressure injury refers to localized damage to the skin and or underlying soft tissue, usually over a bony prominence or related to a medical or other device. So you will see in the definition, NPWAP now states that medical or other devices can also cause pressure injuries. The definition also states that a pressure injury is present as intact skin or as an open ulcer. So previously, in the previous definition, only open ulcers were mentioned in the definition. But the most recent definition of pressure injuries now reflect damage to open as well as intact skin. And this better aligns with the inclusion of stage one as well as deep tissue injury um, stages or categorizations um, as per the National Pressure Ulcer advisory panel staging system, which we'll talk about in more detail a bit later. The definition also states that a pressure injury is the result of intense and prolonged pressure or pressure in combination with shear. So as you will see, there is an emphasis on pressure and shear in this definition, and friction is no longer mentioned because friction is part of shear. And lastly, the definition adds that a pressure injury is affected by microclimate, nutrition, perfusion, comorbidities, and the condition of the soft tissue, which we discuss in terms of the guideline recommendations. So as I had said, um, with regard to the terminology, the changes from pressure ulcer to pressure injuries to represent both uh, injuries to intact and ulcerated skin. And in terms of the pressure injury staging system, the Roman numerals have been changed to Arabic numbers, and it is called staging. And as you will see in the stage of deep tissue injury, that diagnostic label, the term suspected has been removed. They also provided in their most recent definitions uh, the this definition for medical device related pressure injury as well as mucosal membrane uh, pressure injury. 
And just to let you know, um, you don't have to go, you don't, no, don't worry about making notes. So we will have these uh, slides posted for all of you and we can uh, send that link to you after the presentation. So uh, medical device related pressure injuries describes an etiology and it's a result from the use of devices designed and applied for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. And the resultant pressure injury generally conforms to the pattern or shape of the device. The injury should be staged using the NPWAP staging system that currently exists and has been updated. The mucosal membrane pressure injury is found, as it indicates, on mucous membranes uh, with a history of a medical device in use at the location of the injury. But due to the anatomy of the mucous membranes, you cannot use the staging system in order to categorize the, the depth of injury or the extent of the injury on mucous membranes. So in terms of the major focuses of this guideline, in terms of the approaches, uh, the expert panel wanted to emphasize that the wound care team is um, the wound care team is, found, is really important in terms of the assessment and management of pressure injuries. And they wanted to also acknowledge, um, as, you know, in collaboration with the interprofessional team who could be PTs, OTs, uh, physicians, dietitians, that's not an inclusive list, that it's also important to collaborate with the person in the person's circle of care. Um, in this guideline, the person's circle of care refers to paid and unpaid caregivers, such as PSWs, DSWs, primary caregivers, uh, substitute decision makers, families, and friends. What's also important in this guideline, and I'm just going to flip the slide here, is a person, and actually person and family-centered approach to this guideline as well. The expert panel wanted to emphasize uh, a person-centered perspective in all of the recommendations that have been written in this guideline. So in doing that and to make sure that we had a consistent approach, um, approach to all the recommendations with regard to considering the patient in terms of all of them, we recruited a patient representative to sit on the panel as well as invited advocacy groups to provide stakeholder feedback during the guideline development process. And Karen will talk more about the importance of collaborating with the person with the pressure injury as we delve into more detail on the practice recommendations. So now in terms of the NPU, NPUAP pressure injury staging system, I'm going to have Gary and Karen talk to the stages as they appear in the guideline. Hi, it's Karen uh, Campbell here, and I'm just going to have you, Grace, scroll down. Uh, you can see that the MPUAP actually separates out light and, and dark uh, pigmented skin. As when you're assessing uh, the stage of the pressure injury, you need to be assessing your patients differently. Grace, can you show the um, stage one? So the stage one pressure injury is a localized uh, area of non-blanchable erythema. And if you actually look uh, and go on the NPUAP uh, website, it shows you um, what that non-blanchable or blanchable erythema looks like. It will appear differently in darkly pigmented skin. And sometimes blanchable erythema is also associated with changes in sensation, temperature, and or firmness of the tissue. Anything that looks purple or maroon um, would, be a, would be a deep tissue injury, so it's not a stage one. Can you move on to um, stage two pressure injury? So this is partial thickness skin loss. And I'd like to point out that um, uh, Grace, can you move on to stage two and show the actual picture of picture of the injury? It is I don't... now on the screen, Karen. Oh, it is? Okay. So I'd like to point out that there's partial loss of skin with exposed dermis, and the wound bed is viable. It's pink or red, moist, um, and may present either as an intact or ruptured serum-filled blister. There is no slough or eschar, and granulation tissue is not present. Um, and we want to make sure that clinicians do not describe moisture-associated skin, skin damage or things like incontinence-associated dermatitis or intertriginous dermatitis or any medical-related uh, skin injury. These are not stage twos. As well, we need to make sure that we are not calling 
skin tears or burns or abrasion stage two. So we need to um, make sure that you separate out uh, these moisture-associated skin damage or any uh, traumatic uh, wounds. Now, a stage three is full loss of skin in which adipose or fat is visible in the ulcer and granulation tissue or rolled edge are often present. Slough or eschar may be visible, and as I said, it is not visible in a stage two pressure injury. But if the slough or eschar obscures the extent of tissue loss, then this is now an unstageable pressure injury. And until uh, that um, um, eschar or slough is removed from the wound bed, you're really unable to determine the depth of injury. So Gary, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so I, I think Karen's done a great job in starting us off, but just to mention, the skin can only react in so many ways. And when you're looking at a potential pressure injury, make sure it's over a pressure area on the body. And that location is important. In stage four pressure injury, we're looking at a full thickness skin and tissue loss. And this definition contains a term that you may not all be familiar with and should be, epiboli, which is rolled edges. And the base of this kind of full tissue injury is either to directly exposed or palpable fascia, muscle, tendon, ligament, cartilage, bone in the ulcer. So this is important and there may be slough and of course, if again it obscures the base of the ulcer, then it becomes unstageable. So let's look at the unstageable one. And here you see if you've got slough or eschar that is really avoiding us being able to look at the base of the ulcer. It should be called unstageable until this slough or eschar is removed or in a portion of the ulcer you can see a deep structure. Now when we move on to deep tissue injury, it's persistent non-blanchable, much like um, stage one but it's a deep maroon or purple discoloration. And this again may appear differently in darkly colored skin. And the wound may evolve to reveal the actual injury so that not all of these deep tissue injuries actually ulcerate and break down. Or they may ulcerate very quickly, but it does not describe vascular, traumatic, neuropathic, or other dermatological conditions. So you need to be very, very careful with suspected deep tissue injuries. Okay, let's now move on to uh, the next section, um, which I believe is the guiding framework. This is based on Wound Bed Prep 2015. And we certainly believe in looking at the whole patient and not just the hole in the patient. <laughs> we want to treat the cause and we want to address patient-centered concerns before thinking of local wound care. But you'll notice this framework that's uh, been published since the year 2000 has a new bar in it and it's determine healability. And we will divide all ulcers into, and pressure injuries is a kind of ulcer, but not all pressure injuries are ulcers and that's why the terminology change into healable, maintenance, and non-healable or palliative wounds. Then that's going to influence our local wound care of where we look at debridement, inflammation, infection, and moisture balance. But if it's non-healable and maintenance, we're going to look at moisture reduction and bacterial reduction, so our choice of topical agents is going to change. The edge effect is really only for healable wounds uh, that are stalled. And you have to make sure you've corrected the cause, address patient-centered concerns, and that you've optimized local wound care. Uh, Karen, let's look at healability of pressure injuries and uh, this new terminology, and I find it very useful in practice. I was uh, with some of my students recently in uh, long-term care and we were looking at some patients with uh, pressure injuries. And just to give you some examples of non-healable um, wounds, so we had patients that had um, 
several uh, comorbidities uh, that could not be better managed. Nutrition was a huge problem. Um, pain was a huge problem, and they were more at end of life um, in terms of their care. And so we determined in that situation, because of the multiple, multiple problems that could not be corrected and weren't really appropriate given the, the situation that the patient was at and their specific wishes, we determined that these were non-healable and more palliative. Sometimes you have people who have um, multiple comorbidities and it takes a bit of time to get them better managed. Uh, and so we tend to call those uh, maintenance wounds. Sometimes we have patients who are depressed and they're not able to adhere to our treatment plan. And so until some of those um, conditions can be reversed, uh, those wounds are maintenance. And once we've been able to reverse those, then we can start uh, looking at the wound now being healable. Gary, would you add anything to that? I think the healable wound, we want adequate blood supply to heal, and we need to correct the cause. And, you know, in the series we've had so far, mostly leg and foot ulcers, 70% are healable, 25% are maintenance, and 5% are non-healable. And that's a useful figure to keep in your head, but I think we should move on. Okay, so just in the interest of time, um, all I'm going to say about the guideline development process, it is a rigorous process that we go through in order to take only the, you know, the best evidence that um, is available in order to support or help support the guideline recommendations. And that the, the final recommendations that we have come up with are 25 practice recommendations, two education recommendations, and two system organization and policy recommendations. So now I'm going to quickly pass it on to Karen and Gary to delve into the practice recommendations um, in more detail. Hi folks, so I was talking a little bit about this when we were discussing healability and I would really like to stress the need for a comprehensive assessment. So you need to conduct a very thorough health his history, including a psychosocial history, and actually do um, a physical exam. And that's looking at all systems. And the reason that is so important is that you need to look at all of the comorbidities that are modifiable. I'm going to speak later to pressure and shear and nutrition, but I'm talking about things like diabetes, uh, cancer, um, congestive heart failure, depression, and stressing how important it is to identify them. Are, there, are they being managed as well as they can be? Could they be better improved? And, and often they can be. Um, what, I, what I find is that I hear sometimes stories that the patient's non-adherent or doesn't have motivation. And often what I find is that they're depressed. And uh, once we're able to identify the depression and get it treated, uh, then a lot of that can change. But when, you're, when you have a patient with a pressure injury, they are also at risk to develop another another pressure injury. So you have to keep uh, your risk assessment in the forefront. You have to know that although you're treating maybe an ulcer on their sacrum, you want to prevent, or, uh, prevent ulcers or um, injuries on their heels, on their elbows, and so on. And uh, lastly, uh, when you're looking at assessment, I would like to just point out that there are validated assessment tools, and the one that I'd like to point out to you is the PUSH tool. The reason that I like to talk about the PUSH tool is that it is easy to use and easy to implement in most, in most healthcare settings. So I'll just move on to the next slide. Okay, in this next slide, uh, we're looking at recommendation 1.4 that's new, assessing signs and symptoms of infection. And you can find more detail in the appendixes, and certainly the RNAO does not endorse one enabler over another, but you have to think of what you can treat topically as being critical colonization or the surface, and it's like a thin layer of soup in a soup bowl. And the deep and surrounding infection is the soup bowl. And in the one mnemonic I have been known for, there are four criteria in the side of the bowl and three on the bottom. And it's very important that it's not just cellulitis that indicates infection and needing systemic therapy. 
Recommendation 1.5, screen all persons for the risk of malnutrition. Determine nutritional status of all persons at risk for malnutrition and perform a comprehensive nutrition assessment. Three things. There are three stages to nutrition assessment. First is the screen for risk of malnutrition. And the Canadian Nutrition Screening Tool, and again the RNAO does not endorse one tool over another, has two very simple questions and you should really look at this. The first question is, have you lost weight in the past six months without trying to lose weight? And the second, have you been eating less than usual for more than a week? And if they answer yes to both of these questions, you really need to go on to determine the nutritional situation and in selected patients you need a comprehensive nutrition assessment. And then you'll see in 1.6, assess for pressure injury pain. This is extremely important. You know in the 90s, surveys showed that patients considered pain number one and healthcare professionals considered it number five or six. Is the pain coming from your local wound care, debridement, or is it coming from the cause of the wound between dressing changes or procedures? And that there are two kinds of pain, nociceptive and neuropathic. And you need to realize that wound associated pain is both. And the treatments are different. And so that it's important for you to pay attention to this. All righty. So the next recommendation talks about conducting a, a mobility and support service assessment. And this is really when your OT and PT can be of great help. But what I would also like to point out is you need to actually do that again whenever there's a significant change in the person's uh, medical condition. And I'd just like to point out some examples using medically frail people who are either at home, in long-term care, or who often are admitted to hospital when there's been a change in their health status. So when they get the flu, a pneumonia, or even a UTI, it's often enough to just tip them over the balance from being mobile and being able to turn in bed to becoming bed and chair bound. And now they're not eating well because they're not feeling well. And now you have someone who may have been at lower risk, uh, who now is at higher risk, and they already have a pressure injury. In my own personal life, my husband recently passed away and went through a year where he was um, uh, quite sick with acute leukemia. And I saw he went from being a marathon runner to a person who was quite medically uh, frail, even though he was not elderly. And it often didn't take much uh, to tip him over the edge and for his skin to become very vulnerable. I'm going to turn it over to Gary. Yeah, and we're going to give you some new information on vascular assessment of the lower extremity of all persons with pressure injuries on initial examination, and particularly this applies to heel ulcers. And on the next slide, or heel injuries, a palpable pulse, if you can feel the dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial, you've got 80 millimeters of mercury. An ankle brachial pressure index is greater than 0.5, or you'll notice this upper limit for calcified vessels a little bit higher now, 1.3. So if it's in this range, uh, then you've probably got healability. Transcutaneous oxygen is not universally available, but in hyperbaric units, it measures the sum total of the large vessels, the small vessels, the amount of edema in the skin and the temperature of the skin, it should be greater than 30, but you need greater than 40 for normality or regular healing. Greater than 30, uh, you may heal, but it'll be delayed. Toe pressures. The artery in the large toe never gets calcified all the way around, and you want a pressure of 55 millimeters of mercury or greater. One of our problems is elderly population, especially people with diabetes, have calcified vessels so that your ankle brachial pressure index is not reliable. And I'm going to introduce here an audible handheld Doppler, and whether it's biphasic or triphasic. So on the next slide, we have published a paper uh, with the help of an international uh, vascular surgeon, Dieter Meyer, in a high-ranking vascular surgery journal. Uh, 
And we looked at audible Doppler signals. And monophasic is biphasic is and triphasic is and we can easily distinguish these and a specificity for no peripheral vascular disease for the posterior tibial was 98.6 and the dorsalis pedis 97.8. It does not as sensitivity identify the vascular disease, you need the full vascular assessment in the lab. But it's got great positive and negative predictive value. So you may want to look at this article and it certainly simplified our practice and allowed us to um, really have an onset of treatment maneuvers like compression or controlling leg edema which can influence pressure injuries on the heel uh, much more quickly with safety. Alrighty, I'd like to talk a little bit about the interprofessional team. The expert panel, and I think all of us who are clinicians on that panel, felt strongly that you need a complete uh, interprofessional team to care for people with pressure injuries. We need OTs, PTs, MDs, physicians, nurses. We need social work, psych, psychology, whoever you have in your area to help with some of the psychosocial uh, aspects of, of, of care of our, of our patients. And uh, I'd also like to point out that the person actually with the injury is at the center of that team. And so often we think of the interprofessional team as being professionals, but the person with the injury and or their, their the circle of care, they're at the very center of that care. So when we develop our pressure injury care plan, it has to be in collaboration with that person. We have to consider their, their goals, their goals of care may not be wound healing. Their goals of care may be being able to take care of their children or to visit their grandchildren. And so it may not be what we would think of as the goals of care, but we really need to develop a, a plan of care that incorporates the person's goals. Again, I lived through this personally recently and uh, I know how important this is. So going on to the next slide, there's a change actually in the very first recommendation where we used to always say uh, reposition every two hours. Now the guideline is every two to four hours. But I have to tell you that is on the assumption that that individual is on a pressure redistribution foam uh, surface. And so if the person is uh, potentially on an inappropriate hard uh, mattress, um, they need to be turned every two hours, but if they are on um, a pressure redistribution surface and their, their, their skin can tolerate a Q2 four hour, or the Q4 hour turn, then you can consider that. When people are, are, are chair bound, it's still every 15 minutes. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about nutrition. As we all know, nutrition is an, a very important part of uh, pressure injury assessment and treatment. And we need to implement an individualized uh, nutrition uh, care plan. And you need your dietitian to do this. You can go on to the next slide, uh, Grace. And I just want to point out in the next slide um, uh, that um, that the dietitian would do an assessment in collaboration uh, with the person and the things that they would implement in a nutritional uh, plan of care are listed there. I would like to say though that this is not a recipe for how you would treat all people with pressure injuries. There are many contraindications for a high protein diet, things like renal failure, liver problems. There are contraindications for vitamin C and so the dietitian would uh, assess the person and then develop a comprehensive plan based on their assessment and then individual characteristics. Just want to go back to one slide because I had a thought that I, I missed to, to point out with this, uh, with this slide when I'm talking about the support surfaces. You need to consider the, the support surfaces that the person is on over a 24-hour period. Now, often when they're in hospital, that may be better chair, but that also could be their commode chair, their shower chair, that could be their car. Um, it could be, uh, you know, if they fly, 
It could be the airplane seat. So you really need to think about wherever that person is over a 24 hour period. Sorry about that, but we'll carry on now and go on um, to um, the next slide. And we're looking at providing pressure entry care consisting of cleansing, and hopefully this is normal saline or potable water. Moisture balance, infection control, and that's critical colonization, deep and surrounding infection, and debridement. And I'm going to refer you to the reference in the guideline, which is wound bed prep uh, 2015, uh, for more information on this in more detail. But I will talk um, in a minute about packing materials after Karen talks about electrical stimulation. So I'd like to just talk briefly about electrical stimulation and there's high level evidence to support that it does speed wound healing but in healable wounds and when you use electrical stimulation you still have to implement all the other recommendations so you have to modify all the comorbidities you have to make sure people are well nourished and and when you consider that electrical stimulation when it is available can make a huge impact Gary, could you speak for a moment about debridement on sta stable heel ulcers um, that are black and there's black eschar? Yeah, and I think if they're stable, uh, you're probably better leaving them intact because if you debride them, you're creating a bigger hole. And if in any way the microcirculation is compromised, it's advantage bacteria, disadvantage host. And you may cause that proximal uh, limb threatening or even life threatening infection. So I'd really warn you against doing that. And when you're painting povidoniidine, you don't paint it just on the black eschar. It's really the edge between the viable and non-viable tissue that needs the povidoniidine. On the next slide and on this theme, that was a good segue, Karen. Um, we're really looking at wound packing material, and I think this is important to think of form versus function. It's in the wound bed prep article, but I'm going to present it in a different way. And each of these enablers are evidence-based and tested for validity and reliability. Thank you, Irma Jean. We did not put that in. And when we're looking at dry saline gauze, it's going to absorb exudate. It's actually not antibacterial, and it's really a bacterial culture media. Moist saline gauze will donate moisture, but again, it's a culture media. Povidone iodine-soaked gauze will deliver iodine to the surface of the wound. It actually penetrates the glycocalyx of a biofilm better uh, than silver or any of the other topical antimicrobials. This is work from Greg Schultz, and I'm sure many of you have heard his name. And it decreases uh, bacteria in the surface compartment. But you have to look at tissue toxicity and you have to be careful about large areas uh, for long periods in people with thyroid disease. PMHB gauze, which is AMD gauze or polyhexylmethylene biguanide gauze, absorbs exudate. The antibacterial is in the gauze, so it will sterilize above the wound and there are good electron micrographs to show this, but there's no tissue toxicity because it does not go into the surface of the wound. So this is really just a little exercise for form versus function, and you should fluff, not stuff. If you stuff that packing in, you're going to create pressure on the edges of the injury, and if you create pressure on the edges, you could very well do damage. Just like pushing in a lot of irrigation fluid, you don't get it back, or you might cause damage on the wall. Okay, Karen. So if um, people are considering laser therapy, stop that practice right away. There is, there is evidence for um, ultrasound, ultraviolet, and electromagnetic therapy. Also, I'd like to point out here that we do not use negative pressure wound therapy to heal um, pressure injuries, but they can be used in exceptional circumstances for stage three and stage four pressure injuries for quality of life, sometimes to bridge to surgery, and sometimes when managing large, large volumes of exudate when people are at home so that they don't need to have frequent dressing changes. So moving on um, to the next slide, uh, just um, 
like to point out that people are always changing. So we as human beings are constantly evolving. So should your um, assessment, uh, so should your risk assessment, and so should your evaluation of that person. The wound could be getting better, uh, and we need to then change our plan of care as the, as the wound evolves. The person also could develop, um, as I said earlier, um, a flu, a pneumonia, or even a UTI, and um, their health status, if they're medically frail, that can make a huge change in terms of their risk. Moving on to the next slide. Okay, so we're on to education recommendations. And the best education is interactive, longitudinal, uh, based on day-to-day -day practice, uh, situational, so it's really at the bedside. It's interprofessional with doctor, nurse, and allied health. And it has enablers and reinforcers for practice. Enablers, look at your whole uh, list of enablers within the guideline. Reinforcing, you need a colleague with more knowledge or who is expert in an area when the first time you try something new and it doesn't work. But this all needs to be tied into the healthcare system. So we as clinicians, I think we have to advocate within our organizations to obtain resources to provide best practice within our workplaces. Talk to your manager, write a business plan, take on a leadership role. And there are groups like RNAO, the Canadian Association of Wound Care, the Ontario Wound Care Interest Group, who are out there lobbying and advocating for us. Join these groups, volunteer your time, because they all, they all work on volunteer work. So volunteer your time, and that's how I think uh, we as uh, clinicians who are out practicing in the field can move this agenda forward at a macro and at a micro level. Hey, so thank you very much, Karen and Gary, for that fabulous talk on the guideline recommendations. Um, I'd now like to open the floor to the audience for any questions that you may have. We have about 10 minutes to field any questions uh, for Gary or Karen or myself or Irma Jean. And we see Bonnie Kearns has asked us that she worked in Afghanistan for six months, saw many pressure ulcers packed with either honey or sugar and covered, but the family had to stay awake all night making sure the rats didn't come for the sugar. You need to be careful with these modalities because when they're hyperosmolar, uh, they're antibacterial, but as soon as they get diluted with wound exudate, they become bacterial food. And when you start smelling uh, these wounds, it's really dangerous. And, you know, you're much better coating the wound with povidone iodine and then maybe using these as an osmotic agent. But, you know, even better things than this are coating a wound with povidone iodine and putting KY jelly in the wound. And there is in vitro evidence that KY jelly is a, a very good hydrogel. Uh, Karen, do you want to tackle zinc supplementation, have a role uh, to play in the healing of wounds? That's a great question. It's very controversial, and the panel felt that there just wasn't enough evidence to support that at this time, but very good question. And I'll add to that, the zinc deficiency state in dermatology, we always have big terms so nobody knows what we're talking about, but it's acrodermatitis enteropathica. And if somebody's really deficient in zinc and it's not usually the limiting factor in wound care, they get a rash uh, like a baboon's around their bum and in their groin, but also around the mouth that's very characteristic of this. And uh, this is usually young children with congenital uh, zinc deficiency. Why is laser therapy not recommended, Karen? And I want to add my two cents in this too. There's no evidence. Uh, and, uh, you know, good question. I actually see advertisements in my local newspaper for um, people offering, uh, you know, laser treatment to basically cure everything. And so, uh, Stop that practice. There are other um, modalities, such as electrical stimulation, which has very high level evidence. Uh, UVC has, you know, evidence. Uh, ultrasound has evidence. And so let's go after um, adjunctive therapies that have the evidence and have been um, 
uh, tested and trialed with eSIM, there is like um, systematic reviews that show that it works. Yeah, and I think, you know, there are over 10 random controlled trials. The problem with laser is that, you know, if you have too high a voltage and uh, you can actually cause a lot of harm and actually cause necrosis of the skin. And, you know, it really depends on the kind of laser, the stage of the wound, uh, the depth of the signal. And, you know, there's much more chance of causing damage than um, really coming out with a success outcome. Lasers are always so sexy, but always so dangerous, and I would really avoid that. Um, I do see an easy one up there about posting the Canadian Nutrition Screening Tool. Thanks, please. Post the reference. Well, all you have to do is go to Appendix M in your guideline, and it is right there for you, and uh, it is listed. Um, in the guideline, and it really is a nice little gem of a tool uh, for you to look at. Uh, Karen, Whirlpool has come up here, and I think that uh, Whirlpool therapy is interesting, but one of the problems is contamination, and mm -hmm. it's very hard to get MRSA and some VRE and some bad organisms, so you're going into a Whirlpool uh, with bacterial soup, and that bacteria is then spreading to every other open area, crevice, et cetera, that might be in the whirlpool. So even in the U.S. where, you know, a lot of physiotherapy uh, departments were using this extensively um, and certainly part of burn therapy, it does present several infection control dilemmas. And there are much better ways to do similar things with compresses if you're trying to add moisture to the wound surface or soaks where you're trying by coagulating protein uh, to um, actually saturate the wound. So I don't think Whirlpool, except in very exceptional uh, circumstances, is going to work. There's a great question for the RNAO. What is the plan for guideline dissemination and can we help? Grace, this is... Excellent. <laughs> Oh, well, actually, um, the, the webinar is one dissemination strategy. Uh, we also have the Wound Care Institute that's coming up um, late February, early March, um, which we base the curriculum on, on the guidelines. And, of course, we'll be using the pressure injury guideline, the latest edition, in terms of providing more information and as well as uh, some clinical practice when it comes to um, the assessment and management and prevention of pressure injuries. Karen is actually uh, one of the expert co-facilitators of that event. Um, if you're interested in attending, just let us know. Also, in terms of the, the dissemination, um, there have been uh, many uh, hard copies that have been circulated to major organizations um, and endorsers for the guidelines. So, for example, CAET and uh, Canadian Patient Safety Institute, um, as well as the Canadian Association for Wound Care. So they will also have, will be endorsing or have been endorsing that uh, information and been circulating information with regard to any events that are going on. Um, in terms of more help. Um, Absolutely. We're yeah. a sort of a team here. We're always uh, happy for help. And uh, the more you can uh, refer people, uh, practitioners, as well as your clients, to the fact that there is a guideline that's focused on best evidence to better. And one area I should mention is we will certainly be in full force at the Canadian Association of Wound Care Conference uh, in November and uh, absolutely will be having uh, copies of the guideline available. And we are out at many other uh, events uh, with this guideline and it's always uh, available, freely downloadable on the website. And in fact, all of our international uh, spotlights and contacts are also very aware of this resource. And the I, other, I the other thing, sorry, Gary, the other thing people can do is uh, join ONTWIG, which is an interest group of RNAO. They have working groups. Uh, join and volunteer for one of their working groups. That's a great suggestion, Karen. Wonderful. Thank you. And the other suggestion I have that's interesting, we'll be using this guideline as part of um, a collaborative effort with the RNAO, 
the Canadian Association of Wound Care and the Ontario government called Project ECHO. And this is extension for community health care outcomes. And we will be developing expert teams within each of the local health integrated networks in Ontario. And we will be using this guideline really as the uh, basis uh, for our recommendations uh, within that program. And that will be a weekly program coming over the next few months. I see what's the difference between skin wound category 2 injury and stage 2 pressure ulcer. Well, they're the same thing uh, except that the definition, um, it really, stage 2 is really not an ulcer. It isn't the loss of um, epidermis with a dermal or dermal base or deeper base, but in fact, a stage 2 uh, pressure injury is often an erosion um, or a blister. And uh, an erosion is the loss of epidermis with an epidermal base. And what I like about the new definitions is it's like a 360. Most of the exclusions are included. Based on the wound packing slides, is it a recommendation now to use PHMB gauze for filling the wound cavity? Uh, for many patients, that may be a recommendation based on those criteria. But if somebody's got critical colonization or they've got a deep infection and you want to do something to that surface compartment, you may start off with povidone iodine initially and then uh, gradually switch to uh, PHMB. Karen, can you talk about the PUSH assessment tool? Yes, good question. What I love about the PUSH is that it is very simple. Uh, there's three things you need to look at. So um, you measure length head to toe uh, and width perpendicular to length. Uh, and so I know that sometimes that doesn't make sense because the width is, is longer than the length, but it's a consistent way of measuring. So head to toe, then you figure out the, the, um, the surface area, um, and, uh, and then you look at the um, exudate. And what have I forgotten, Gary? I'm having a senior's moment, people. There's one other thing. <laughs> what I like about it is there are other tools that have 12 or 13 things, which I know in the real world, people don't, you know, you need something that's uh, valid and reliable, but it's also practical and easy to use. So, you know, all you need is a simple ruler and, uh, and, and your eyes and your brain. That's why I like it versus uh, the Bates-Jensen wound assessment tool, which has way too much in there. And, uh, you know, you have to measure about 15 uh, parameters. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, fluid needs really are patient-dependent, and recommendations for those should really come from the dietitian and looking at somebody's fluid and electrolyte balance. There's some interesting comments here, though, as staging a pressure injury is more than non-blanchable redness. Reliability of interpreting may be more difficult. Should stage one be included in prevalence and incidence audit of pressure injuries? My tendency is to say no, because there are more mistakes in uh, stage or level one than any other level. So I, I uh, rely more on stage two to stage four studies than including stage one. And you know, stage two usually comes from the outside in. And the real pressure injuries arise from uh, a deep uh, tissue injury and uh, if you like, level or stage three and four. And so even stage two, if it's included in the figures, may need to be separated. Karen, I'm sure you've got an opinion on this one. Oh, I do. <laughs> and my opinion is different than Gary. So you can see that there is no 100% uh, consensus on this. Um, some parts of the world have not, they have gotten rid of stage one. Um, I assess stage one, but I use the, the you know, the clear, um, the clear um, uh, device so that you can actually see because I find the finger method um, not very reliable. Um, and, uh, but I think you may see in a few years a change. Um, right now we still have that listed as a pressure injury, but, you know, 10 years down the road, I'm not sure what's going to happen. As the science evolves, as we all evolve, then we may see changes. But very good question and comment. Okay. How do you measure pressure in the feet and toes? This is the last one. 
Okay. Uh, it's really important when you, uh, dorsalis pedis, uh, if you can feel the pulse, it's 80, or posterior tibial, it's roughly 80 millimeters of mercury or more. For the toe pressure, it's a special device, and some of the new portable Dopplers have this special device. And if you figure out what's roughly the diameter of a large toe, it's where the device first originated from, but I probably won't tell you what the name of it is, but it's part of the male anatomy. And uh, so that that's really how that is measured. And when you're looking at surgical intervention and consults for surgery, just make sure you've uh, optimized everything else and it's healable. Otherwise, it's not really good. But I'm going to uh, turn this back over uh, to Grace. Just to say on surgery, if you don't have rehab at the other end, 75% uh, of them break down. And this is a very complicated surgery in which patients have to be prepared for six or eight weeks rehab on the other end. And it's uh, level three and level four ulcers. Okay, fantastic. Um, I see that there are a lot, uh, many more questions, uh, but we are running out of time. But if you see on your screen, you have Erica D'Souza's email, and Gary and Karen will be available to answer um, a few more questions after today if you email Erica. And as well, the, the questions that um, haven't been answered on this webinar today, we'll definitely collate them and have Gary and Karen answer them, and I'll post that documentation on the guideline website. So this will be the, the sort of the guideline webpage uh, where you can access the PDF version of the guideline as well as the related documents uh, such as the archived webinar from today as well as the question and answer documentation that I will be preparing in the near future. And you can also um, buy a hard copy that's available to order by contacting us. Um, as I said, there's additional RNAO resources. I had mentioned the, the Wound Care Institute, of which Laura Teague and Karen Campbell are the lead uh, clinical co-facilitators of that week-long event, so it's fantastic. It's our 10th year. Um, with regard to the long-term care toolkit, uh, for RNAO has also developed one, and it also includes updated resources from the pressure injury guideline. There's also a health education fact sheet associated with the guideline as well, as well as a recommendation comparison chart. So it's comparing the recommendations from the 2007 edition of the guideline to the current edition. And these are the references. So thank you very much, uh, Gary and Karen, Irma Jean, and Erica, who has been manning behind the scenes of this webinar today. Um, the presentation has been very valuable, I think, and I hope everyone thinks the same way. And thank you to the audience for attending. Uh, we will be sending you an evaluation survey as well as links to the resources that we were talking about today. Uh, so please um, look out in your inboxes for that email from Erica. Otherwise, um, uh, we uh, welcome you a good day, and uh, thank you very much. Right on. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Grace. You're welcome. Thank you, Grace. Goodbye. Bye.